Hi, I'm Dr. Russell Baker, the director of the Criminal Profiling Program for the Behavioral Forensics Institute. This is our first time together, and uh, I'd like to make an introductory statement to you if I could. Uh, this, this first program is a video because we wanted you to have a sense of who we were, uh, a sense of who I am as your mentor and your primary instructor. We're going to uh, present this video to you very much like a college class. We're not going to edit out any speaking mistakes or those sorts of things. Uh, we want to feel like you're in a, a learning environment uh, that's not overly strict or stringent, uh, that ha doesn't have a lot of requirements on you, something that you can sit back after you've worked all day uh, and that you can enjoy and learn something from. Uh, we're not going to present you with a lot of homework. We're not going to present you with a lot of papers or a lot of examinations. Uh, this is a familiarization course. This is a course designed to teach you the very basics of something you've never been exposed to before. You're going to hear new terms. You'll hear some words that, uh, that may seem even contradictory in their definitions. Uh, you'll hear how various agencies and types of agencies approach the profiling function. And you'll hear a little bit about BFI. Uh, we elected to make this first course uh, an introduction to profiling, uh, specifically an introduction to human dimension analysis, which we'll talk about in depth tonight, uh, because we wanted you to get a flavor of what the program will be, uh, be about. In our next course, which we'll also probably conduct by video, we'll do a sit-down interview to talk a little bit about the profiling, profiling position, uh, excuse me, the profiling profession, see those are those mistakes I was talking about, the profiling profession and some of the questions that, that you may have. We'd like to answer those. We'll give you the opportunity to send in some questions uh, that you would like to have answered. Uh, and we'll spend some time talking about what it's like to be a law enforcement profiler, what it's like to be a, a national defense intelligence profiler, uh, what it's like in the various environments, narcotics versus terror versus uh, typical traditional criminal profiling. Uh, give, you, give you some oversight uh, into your career and help answer some of those questions that are bothering a lot of you. I've, I've heard a lot of those questions over the phone over the last few weeks to a month and, and would really like to address those for you. But we didn't want to jump into that at your very first session because we felt like you uh, enrolled in BFI to learn more about profiling. Uh, so we'll save that career development piece until the next block. Uh, BFI is informal. Uh, as I said, we're not going to have a lot of homework or exam assignments. This, this is a familiarization course. We want you to get your feet wet and we want you to feel free to send us any questions that you might have to request any reading material uh, suggestions that we might be able to offer you. And we want you to regard us as your mentors, uh, sort of uh, in the old days in law enforcement, uh, a mentor was called a rabbi, somebody that you came to and you, you asked those questions of, you didn't want to ask anybody else. Uh, don't be embarrassed to ask us anything. Uh, we realize that we're taking a very different approach. Uh, we're taking a police academy approach to profiling. We're not just jumping in and requiring you to have a four year or six year degree. Uh, we feel like uh, a lot of different things, a lot of different motivations believe, uh, bring people to intelligence work or into uh, law enforcement work. Uh, and for some people, it's the behavioral sciences. Some people have already pursued their degrees. Some people are in the process of pursuing their degrees. Uh, and we'd like to help you along that path. If you've never been a law enforcement officer or an intelligence analyst, well, then we'd like to help you get a leg up on your peers, if you will. We'd, we'd like you to be the one that if all things are equal, they pick because they being the hiring agency picks, selects because they say, this is an individual who put forth the extra effort who went to this training. Uh, this particular program is highly unusual. As you saw on the website and in the uh, reading materials that you've received from us, the, the notices and the letters, um, this is the first ever offering straight for the civilian population, the general public. So uh, let's get started on this adventure together. We uh, will hit some bumps as we go through the process. This is a pilot program. Uh, you are among the first students. You can uh, watch this video at your leisure. You don't have to watch it straight through in one sitting. Just make sure that you make a note of the point at which you paused it so you can find your spot back. And uh, 
just uh, just enjoy what you're doing. Uh, this isn't designed to to be an intense, hard hitting uh, process, but it is intended to provide you with true value added knowledge that can help you decide whether this is the profession you want to be in or this is one discipline of the profession you want to be in. But uh, above all else, know the BFI faculty is here for you. And uh, without further ado, we'll get started on the introduction to human dimension analysis. Uh, this should take about an hour. We'll go through about 35 or so slides in a PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, so this won't be a real long endeavor on this first sitting. Uh, next, the next block of instruction will be a little bit longer, and before you know it, we'll be delving very deep into some, uh, some more uh, intense but not overly strenuous material uh, that will help you advance in this profession. So let's get started. In this block of instruction, we're going to discuss an introduction to human dimension analysis. Human dimension analysis is an all-encompassing term that captures all the various types and flavors of behavioral profiling across the many professions and disciplines. For example, uh, crime scene profiling typically uh, conducted by law enforcement officers where they gather evidence and make inferences from that evidence, uh, make predictions from that evidence, as well as national intelligence profiling. Uh, so there, there's profiling in a variety of professions. We'll discuss that and just remember, if you will, that the overarching and all-encompassing term is human dimension analysis and we'll typically refer to that as HDA. So let's talk a little bit about the definition of HDA. First, let's discuss the end product. The end product is called an operational behavior profile. The terms that you're going to hear in this session are, many, in many cases, original uh, copyright, intellectual property, uh, intellectual proprietary uh, terms. Operational behavior profile is a hybrid investigative approach. The profile is the end written product with all of the imagery, uh, signals intelligence that is um, uh, things like uh, uh, typically you, you'll hear people talking about bugs or being wired, uh, those sorts of different types of intelligence blended in. Uh, the operational behavior profile is a hybrid because it mixes several different types of profiling. It mixes psychological analytical techniques, uh, that is clinical, uh, counseling, educational type techniques. Uh, it it uh, also includes law enforcement analytical techniques, psychometric, which involves testing, military techniques, standard investigative techniques, and uh, fused intelligence, which is that blending, that synthesis of all of those types of intelligence we just talked about. Operational behavioral profiles, OP, OBPs, are not psychological profiles. Psychological profiles are a completely different animal that we'll talk about a little bit later on. OBPs are investigative in nature. They are a document, a narrative that shows that past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. And they examine the target's life and daily activity without documented proof of that behavior uh, or, and or without um, personal interviews. In intelligence profiling, for example, uh, we're examining uh, targets, human beings who are in overseas environments that we only have reporting regarding. Uh, that is, there's a series of reports that have been written by people who've observed him or her and that type of thing. Uh, when we talk about intelligence profiling in this environment, we're limited quite a bit by classification issues so <clears throat> you'll have to forgive me if we don't get into a lot of detail in some specific areas like reporting, but suffice it to say that there is a way that reports are gathered on our human targets. Uh, when it comes to national defense intelligence profiling, uh, our, our people that we're profiling, our bad guys or our suspected bad guys or people we want to influence are referred to as targets. Uh, often they're referred to in the same way in law enforcement in the continental United States, 
uh, England, Canada, and so forth. Uh, so this operational behavior profile adds additional layers of information to come up with this uh, fused intelligence product that can influence, in the case of this slide, we say the commander's decision-making process, but that could be the police chiefs or the chief investigator's decision-making process or even an investigative team's decision-making process. Perhaps it helps determine the best way to set up surveillance. Perhaps it helps determine the best way for a SWAT team uh, to approach a subject who uh, they might be executing a high-risk high warrant uh, upon. So an operational behavior profile, to, to summarize, is the final product. This is what we're working towards. Uh, typically in law enforcement right now, you simply hear it referred to as a profile, and in the intelligence world, you hear it referred to as an operational behavior profile. So that covers that slide. Uh, you can certainly go back in this video and spend as much time as that as you'd like to. So why, why is this topic important? Why do we care about human dimension analysis, and why is there a need to encapsulate all of those different types of profiling under one umbrella? Well, like anything else, it makes it easier to talk to. Behavioral assessments and investigations do matter to all operators. Uh, from a profiler's perspective, an operator is somebody who is out there actually executing, uh, executing investigations, attempting to make arrests, attempting to make captures, uh, so this could be anything from uh, a military team trying to find a bomb maker in Iraq. We'll try to stay away from a, a lot of the, the military terms here. Uh, trying to find a bomb maker in Iraq to somebody that's trying to find a serial rapist in downtown Chicago. So these assessments, these OPPs, these investigations do matter to operators. They make a difference to some degree and in some variation to all operators. Occasionally as a profiler, I'd be dishonest if I didn't tell you that occasionally as a profiler, you, don't, you do run into operators who just uh, uh, discount the very idea that a, that a profile could even work. Uh, there are those types of uh, people in law enforcement, people in intelligence, just like there are in any other business. Uh, one thing that you have to realize as a profiler is that you are uh, on the cutting edge. The next point that we want to talk about is that when it comes to profiling, whether it's in intelligence profiling, criminal profiling, most of our customers, our audience, we're going to refer throughout tonight's session to our audience of police officers and intelligence professionals and decision makers and leaders as customers. Most of our customers aren't really sure what they want. And most analysts, when it comes down to the people actually working packages and in investigations or detectives, aren't really sure what is expected of them in the way of, of profiling. So as a professional profiler, it is very often your job to lead that team, to, to help them understand the very information that you're giving them. You can't expect them to understand information they've never been exposed to before any more than you could be expected to have heard the term human dimension analysis before this training session. There are not enough skilled profilers in law enforcement and in the intelligence profession. There never really will be. Uh, you are in a very unusual situation, as I alluded to at the opening of this uh, session, uh, in that you are civilians who are being offered this opportunity to learn this profession from the ground up very early before you even have a career. Uh, this is pretty significant if you think about it. You are being exposed before you're even hired in some cases to knowledge that will help you dictate the direction that you want your career to follow. Well, there are not enough people like you in this field and that's one reason, the primary reason we started this profession. Uh, like it or not, most profilers in the field right now are uh, in an older age group. Uh, certainly most of them are above say 45, I won't say all of them obviously, but most of them are, are even in their 60s and 70s. Uh, and one reason for that is the education requirements. Uh, but uh, there is a discussion 
underway in the profession, a debate, if you will, about the degree to which uh, a college education really helps. If you are a profiler who is a clinical psychologist, you've definitely got a leg up. If you're a forensic psychiatrist, you're a hundredfold better prepared than someone who, who doesn't have an education. Uh, but we do need to consider uh, that we have to do something to increase the number of profilers that are in the field. Most of the current profilers in DOD, the Department of Defense, are clinical practitioners with little or no intelligence, forensic, or tactical experience. Very many of the quote-unquote profilers operating in the Department of Defense and in law enforcement right now were educational psychologists working in schools and they retired and took on uh, this responsibility is an additional responsibility in a second career. Uh, a lot of them are counseling psychologists. There's, there's no harm in that. There's no foul in that. But certainly, we are not blessed to be inundated with thousands and thousands and thousands of clinical psychologists and forensic psychiatrists working in police departments in the field. They're just not out there. Some do act as consultants, and we're blessed when we have a forensic psychiatrist that's willing to work with a small law enforcement agency, but they're certainly not out there in large numbers. Analysts are a profiling force multiplier. Uh, we had a bit of a glitch on that, that bullet there. Um, there we go. Analysts are a profiling force multiplier if they understand the process and ask the right questions. So you might be wondering, what in the world is a force multiplier? A force multiplier is a person or a piece of technology or a piece of inventory that allows one person to impact the mission in a more substantial way than one person normally would. If you are an effective profiler and you're sitting in an investigations division or a crimes against persons unit and you're there for a law enforcement agency's uh, detectives to come in and talk to every day, you can greatly enhance the ability of those detectives to do their job and, and of course of the patrol officers in turn to do their job in making the arrest on behalf of the investigative divisions. You can also make a difference uh, in the intelligence field by being able to uh, telecommute, if you will, from one location to another continent and provide information through reading the written documentation and the reports and provide that back to the operators in the field so that they're not trying to go through reams and reams of files and determine the best course of action for them. Operational behavior profiling, remember that, OPBs, our end product. Operational behavior profiling requires highly skilled analysts. You must commit yourself to this profession with diligence, motivation, energy, and effort, and you must dedicate your life and your reading time and your study time to becoming the best you can possibly be if you want to make a difference. One thing that you must keep in mind about being a profiler is that you affect people's freedom. People will be arrested based upon judgments you offer or they may be set free based on judgments you offer. And in some case, if you're an intelligence profiler who's working with some systems and some teams, you could result in a loss of life. So you have an ethical obligation to really understand your profession and really dig in the material that, that makes you the best you could possibly be. So from an intelligence viewpoint, a national intelligence viewpoint, or even a state law enforcement intelligence unit, or Intelligence Fusion Center's viewpoint. What are some of the benefits of operational behavior profiling over traditional profiling involving uh, crime scene analysis? Well, first of all, it allows the intelligence profiler and his team or the team he's supporting to understand and exploit social, structural, psychological, and behavioral phenomena to enhance uh, a number of uh, missions and functions on the ground. Uh, one is force protection. Uh, in the military and law enforcement uh, environments, force protection, force, is your friendly forces. It's the people that you are working for and the types of people you're working for. So, for example, you're a state, uh, 
criminal profiler or a state operational behavior profiler uh, and you have riots in a major city and uh, they need some idea of uh, you know who's likely to be a threat against the local police station uh, and they ask you to look at a series of folders and determine the most likely threats and the most likely avenues of threats uh, you would be engaged in force protection so force protection is a big piece of operational behavior profiling uh, if the cops are in danger the public's in danger if the military can execute its mission because it's on the defensive then it's not moving its mission forward it also provides actionable intelligence for the boots on the ground operational behavior profiling provides actionable actionable intelligence for boots on the ground intelligence that doesn't result in action is of little use unless you're trying to build foundational intelligence over a period of time boots on the ground are is another term for operators the people actually doing the job so behavior profilers are able operational behavior profiles are able to provide information that helps the people on the ground do their job we talked about that a little bit on the last slide it also helps with the minimization of needless injuries deaths and destruction by introducing precision into the profiling package, into the mission package. And it provides the operators with the ability to influence, influence exploit, capture, and kill. And that, that last word, kill, is, is very hard for profilers sometimes to deal with. Uh, people who are involved in the social sciences tend to, to not want people to get hurt, but you know sometimes snipers have to take out a threat sometimes the military has to act on a threat and that's a reality of the profiling business and if you're not comfortable with that or if you think you might not be comfortable with that you really need to devote some time to examining your choice of professions uh, because influencing targets exploiting targets capturing and killing targets is part of what profilers do and if you are uncomfortable with any of those four or let's say three because capture applies in, in both cases maybe you don't want to consider intelligence or military or national intelligence and you want to restrict your profiling career strictly to law enforcement where the worst that can capture can happen excuse me is capture uh, but even so if you execute a bad profiling package if you're not fully informed if you don't do your best if you don't show a work ethic if you don't put your energy into that project product you could be capturing people who are completely innocent. Surprise mitigation. Effective profiling can help warn the government of threats in such a way to prevent a threat from ever being executed. That, what we mean by that is you may be so in tune with your target group, let's say you're working a particular culture or a particular hate group or extremist group, you may be so in tune with what they're doing and what they're likely doing or likely to do that you're able to pick up on clues and inform law enforcement you know I think this particular target will think that this particular event which is happening in his locale is too inviting to pass up and we should probably put surveillance on that individual or we should probably start listening to his phone calls to determine whether or not he's likely to act and mitigate that is make less any uh, any threat that he intended to execute profiling is also useful in the recruitment and capture of foreign intelligence sources that is counterintelligence mm -hmm. uh, we can't go into much detail there but profiling can definitely help determine who's likely to be a threat from a particular group of people a particular culture a particular locale and it can also help predict who in our own intelligence services is likely to be turned by the enemy uh, so this is an area that a profiler could specialize in if he he or she wants to you could become a counterintelligence profiler uh, you know if you know these things at the outset like in this very first session we're having tonight then you can begin to train and read and learn and make this your personal flavor of ice cream if you will I want to be a counterintelligence profiler. There's very few. Uh, why don't 
you consider becoming one. You know, now's the time, a good time to start thinking about that, especially if you're young and you've got a full career to devote and you're interested in going to college and getting, getting that advanced education. It gives us an understanding of the individuals and groups involved in political and hostility and crime. Uh, don't you think it's worth our time to understand, for example, what the KKK or some other hate group uh, regards as a trigger for them to act rather than just talk? Um, it also, operational behavior profiling, also helps us with interrogation and interviewing suggestions and strategies. Uh, when I was in one of my previous assignments, I was overseas and we would capture particular targets that I had written profiles on and once they had, they, fr being friendly forces, had those, those um, bad guys, if you will, uh, captured, they would contact me and say, hey, your information was right or mostly right or partly right or mostly wrong. Uh, but now we need your assistance in developing some suggestions on questions that we can ask during interviewing and interrogation. That's very important in cases where you have, for example, kidnapping vic victims that are missing. Uh, time is of the essence. If you have children that are missing, missing children, uh, you catch the bad guy, uh, you have him in custody, and he's stonewalling that may be the time period that that victim is not getting food or water or uh, oxygen is not being replenished or any number of things that can happen uh, that you will learn about in the various case studies as we go through these courses. There are currently some weaknesses in national defense intelligence profiling specifically related to the military, that's what I'm going to talk about the most here to, in this particular case. DOD, again, is the Department of Defense. Uh, profiling in the military is very manpower intensive and time consuming. Uh, that can really be said of every profession, every discipline, because uh, there's always more cases than there are profilers, especially when it comes to the situation where you know we have we require our profilers to have advanced education as well as training as well as experience that's why most of our profilers are of an older age um, I, I can't overstress to you the point that just because we have begun this program to help pique the interest of new uh, profilers and young people who may be wanting to enter this profession education is important. Don't think that because we didn't require an education for you to come to this course, we don't think it's important. Uh, but we do think that everything needs to be held in balance. So these profiling packages take a lot of time to write. They take a lot of time to research, a lot of time to an, an, uh, excuse me, analyze, and a lot of time to synthesize. Uh, and it takes, you know, a person gets on, a, a profiler gets on a package, he has to stay on that product she has to stay on that product until such a time as all the leads have been worked that can be worked before they can move on to the next product, especially again in those time sensitive cases. Uh, profiling is analyst centric. There is not a big pool of profilers that the military, for example, can go to and say, hey, send me 50 profilers this afternoon. That's just not going to happen. Uh, there are cases where uh, psychologists that are attached to military bases counseling families or counseling children uh, in, you know, deployed, family, uh, deployed military members and those sorts of things can step in and look at a case and say, well, yeah, I can help you with the psychopathology, uh, the mental state of this individual, uh, and give some really helpful and clear guidance. But you really need your profilers to be wrapped up in the tactical and operational and sometimes even the strategic mindset of their targets and that's not a part-time job. Uh, within, within the entire profiling field it's very unstructured right now. The very word profiling 
has a lot of meanings to a lot of different people, a lot of different agency types. Um, and everybody thinks theirs, everybody being an agency or, or a profession, everybody thinks theirs is the only one. And that's why we coined years ago the term human dimension analysis. Um, this, this very presentation that you're seeing in this session has been presented now to thousands and thousands of intelligence profilers and law enforcement profilers. Uh, and one reason that we've done that is just to try to standardize the terms so that we're all speaking about the same thing the same way. We also have a lack of technological utility within profiling. And what that means is, is that we don't have a lot of software and technology that we can draw on. There are some new systems and some new processes on the drawing board. There are some systems and processes and software that's already in the field, but they're limited in their specificity and precision to the types of targets that profilers work. So we don't have a lot of technological backup. Human factors. Uh, you will hear in some types of profiling, especially when we interact with profilers from other nations, the term human factors. We're examining human factors, we're a human factors profiler, uh, and they rely on that term to the point that it has really diluted and polluted the profession, if you will. Human factors is an incorrect term. Human factors relies on, is based upon and used for aviation and mechanical and ergonomic foundations. Uh, you know, for example, one ergonomic consideration or one ergonomic use might be what are the human factors associated with sitting in a chair all day working at a desk before a computer? What can we do to make the computer screen more friendly to humans? What can we do to make the office chair more friendly to humans? And yet we have that term currently being uh, inserted into profiling. It doesn't have a place here. If you see that term, you should be aware of that. We never use that term in BFI or ISTA courses. In military profiling right now, forensics play only a peripheral role. There are some forensic psychiatrists, some brilliant forensic psychiatrists in the Department of Defense. I've met a lot of them in the military environments from the various other nations. And by the way, when we say Department of Defense, sort of interpret that to mean all military, um, all friendly military. We're not speaking specifically about our U.S. Department of Defense. We're speaking about military. Uh, but there's, there's not very many forensic psychiatrists in the Department of Defense uh, in the military. You certainly can't reach out to them very easily if you're an analyst with the exception of one or two military installations I've been on where the forensic psychiatrist had other duties and he or she stepped forward and says, just want to let you guys know I am a forensic psychiatrist. If you have a problem in the intelligence world or profiling world, come and see me and I'll be happy to help out. That's a rare occurrence because in the military world, people are already dual-hatted. That means they're, they're working a variety of different jobs and so they're reluctant because of time's sake to come forth and offer their, uh, their assistance at no charge, or, or excuse me, at, at no cost. I don't mean at no charge, I mean at no cost because they simply don't have that time. I didn't explain that very well, but hopefully you took that point away. Uh, the, another problem with the profiling uh, discipline, the profiling function within the military environment is that it's theory intense. There's a lot of belief in what should be, could be, might be versus what is. And profilers have to be very practical people. It doesn't mean that you don't need to know the theory from virtually every profiler out there and most psychologists who focus on this or psychiatrists who focus on this field. Uh, you should be reading all the time and studying all the time. But what it boils down to is you have to take all of that great abstract knowledge and that interesting reading and boil it down to a profile that gets the right people captured and the wrong people uh, allowed to be free. Uh, so you don't have the luxury of a lot of, uh, a lot of theoretical development in, in your career time. 
there are currently no databases uh, that really help profilers very well. There are some uh, databases that are used for terror screening and so forth. We won't talk about those in this session, and we won't talk about them much anyway because they're classified. Most of what, how they do it is classified. Uh, but those, uh, those types of databases are not uh, conducive to conducting the types of inductive investigations that we need to conduct as profilers. Uh, military intelligence profiling is also uh, dominated by the Department of, excuse me, by the Defense Intelligence Agency. Can't talk much about that, but that is, uh, that agency has a core component that is involved in profiling, but they don't call it profiling. Um, and they have other responsibilities as well, and, and we'll just leave that alone. Suffice it to say that it's primarily a DIA function in the federal government. Um, a final point here is that success and metrics are not evidentiary in, in profiling in government as a whole. There is no follow-up. So, for example, when I was writing profiles in the combat environment, uh, I would write my profiles, I would send them out to operators, and I might or might not hear if the bad guy that I'd been working was captured, but then even if I found out that he or she was captured, there was no mechanism for me to follow up and say, uh, here's how I could have made my profile better and to collect data to improve uh, my skill set and my profiling um, products. So let's talk a little bit about um, about profiling and some of the myths of profiling. Uh, one of the biggest enemies that we have is TV shows. Uh, frankly, I don't watch any of them. Some of them may be great by now for all I know, uh, but in the past they have not been. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about the myths that the general public believes uh, and a lot of professionals believe. There is a belief that profiling is one single collection of techniques across all the disciplines and all professions that all rely on, rely on the same methods, all follow the same procedures, and are all practiced by indiv individuals from the same background. That's certainly not true as we discussed earlier. Sorry for the pause there, we had a, had a stuck slide. Um, so uh, let's look at some of those specific myths. Only psychologists or psychiatrists or mental health professionals or sociologists or theologians, those are people that are involved in religious, uh, religious study, or detectives or FBI agents can be licensed or certified or practice as profilers. That is simply not true. Um, there, up until now, have been no licensed pro profilers, if you will, and there is not an uncontested field of profiling. We've had some brilliant, brilliant people from the FBI Behavioral Sciences Unit that have done some great work in evidentiary profiling, crime scene analysis, prediction, uh, inferences, inductive and deductive reasoning, and those sorts of things that we'll talk about in in future sessions. We definitely want to give those fine professionals their due, but there is not a set of profiling standards that extends into all professions. And this lack of clarity extends even into the specific field of behavioral profiling. So these certification courses that we're presenting now are some of the first courses ever presented. In fact, uh, BFI uh, wrote, if, if you will, invented, designed, developed, and executed the very first intelligence profiling courses ever. And we offered those courses uh, across a wide range of government agency agencies. Most of that work is classified. All of the current profilers who are graduates of those courses are cleared personnel. That is, they hold a secret clearance or above. Uh, but we tried to standardize within the intelligence field and now we're trying to standardize within the broader field. And you are blessed to be part of that effort uh, because you are on the ground floor. 
what you do with this knowledge is really up to you, but you're certainly being exposed to it now. So let's take a, a look, a multidisciplinary look at profiling uh, across, uh, across professions. Profilers, regardless of profession, earn their credentials by intense study and research within their respective fields. Okay, and there's a lot of fields. Uh, you, again, are not being required to go through the formal education of college. You're getting the coursework uh, straight out of the gate, if you will, early in your career, before you even have a career in many cases. Uh, again, we really strongly encourage you to get into a formal education setting. Uh, but within the different professions, let's take a look at a few and, and see where they might get their, uh, their credentials. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Profilers can be certified or recognized through a variety of behavioral, forensic, medical, or law enforcement associations or through training. You're doing both of those. We required sponsorship of you in this program because we hope to help you maintain your records and set up those standards. We wanted to help set up those standards for you in your career going forward. Uh, there was no mechanism for civilians to come into profiling and have their records stored, sort of like a registrar or an admissions office would do with a college. That's what the association does for you. So that $80 fee if you join the National Profilers Association, which is a new association designed specifically for the civilians, but we will be inviting the former students of all the intelligence classes to join that profession as well and we intend to try and merge that intelligence association with this general citizenry, general civilian uh, and law enforcement uh, association. But there are other ways that you can be uh, designated if you want to a profiler. There are profilers in the field of criminal justice. There are lawyers who are profilers. One of the most effective and prominent uh, criminal profilers is a, is a very skilled lawyer and he is also a forensic psychiatrist. There are profilers in medicine uh, who just do uh, profiles having to do with specific types of conditions or types of victims or types of perpetrators. Um, even down to types of wounds and, and how they're made and those sorts of things. But that's still a form of profiling, isn't it? There are profilers in political science who write geopolitical profiles looking at leaders or key actors in other countries or even in our own country and trying to determine what their motivations are, what their skills are, what their direction of action is. Obviously there's psychology profilers, psychological profilers, there's also sociological profilers who look at networking and how, how and why groups do certain things within their social structure. And yes, there are theological profilers, people who will look at profilers, excuse me, who look at profiles from the viewpoint of religion and ideology. I've worked with some of them. They, they have their degrees in theology, and yet they work very effective profiles of other cultures because they understand other cultures. They understand the religion and what makes those cultures tick. You can obviously go online and find a variety of other um, types of entities who offer profiling in one form or another. Some are restricted to advanced education, highly advanced education in many cases. I myself am in some of those types of associations. Um, and we're, I'm going to show you this slide in the next one as well just to give you an example of a couple of, of those types of organizations. Um, the Investigative Psychology uh, site, I don't know if that site is still current or not. This slide's actually a few years old. Uh, but they were actually running some pretty good courses over in London, as I recall. Uh, but those types of organizations are out there. Well, the National, Psycho the National Profilers Association and BFI are doing these same types of things, but we're doing them in a different way. We're offering the courses, you attend the courses online, you get your training, and then we will do our best to help place you in uh, positions as well. We'll talk about that in the career development session, which uh, is your next course. 
uh, a third example. And we won't cover that anymore. You can look that up all you desire and get involved to the extent you, you um, uh, are interested. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the difference, uh, different approaches and, and what's what within this field. You've heard me talk a, a good bit about forensic psychiatry. Uh, forensic psychiatrists are different than psychologists in that forensic psychiatrists are actually medical doctors. I've met several in the military, for example, uh, in the Air Force who are flight surgeons and, and they just uh, chose that, that direction for their career, but their real background was forensic psychiatry. It's a branch of medicine that focuses on the law interface between law and the mental health and mental health. And they provide support to the community in criminal investigations, criminal matters, civil litigation, such as uh, uh, cases of involving everything from domestic abuse to child custody to evidence concerns, uh, competence, the, uh, you know, how uh, can a person remain in society or do they need to be removed from society and undergo treatment, therapy, uh, inpatient treatment, whatever the case may be. And they also make findings regarding mental health, which we'll talk about a lot during the um, course of this program. Not this session, but this program. Next is the field of psychology. There are clinical and counseling psychologists and these types of professionals strive to understand and prevent and relieve psychologically, uh, psychologically caused distress or dysfunction and help with well-being and personal development. There's two types. There's the PhD that's trained in treatment and research uh, and then there's the PsyD, a psychological doctor, which emphasizes clinical training and, and sort of minimizes research. There are a number of PsyD programs uh, available now. If you are really dedicated to become a, becoming a profiler, uh, either one of these two career fields or forensic psychiatry is just mm -hmm. what the, pardon the pun, the doctor ordered for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about profiling in psychiatry and psychology. It's, as I said earlier, rare to find psychologists or psychiatrists not employed uh, in a, rare to find psychologists or psychiatrists uh, not employed in a law enforcement setting who only conduct profiling in their daily duties. Um, that's a bit of a bite of a bullet there, but uh, what I'm trying to say here, the point I'm trying to make is that it's very rare to find profilers who are psychiatrists or psychologists and do that work every day unless they're employed by a law enforcement agency, and there's not many of them at all who are. Typically, the larger agencies will have somebody sort of on a retainer that they can go to once in a while, but it's just not that frequent. And that's why it's essential that we introduce more profilers into the field, more practitioners, field practitioners, if you will. Uh, and so as a result, when a law enforcement has a need, unless they have an FBI behavioral sciences unit trained profiler at their disposal, they'll go to a local psychologist or psychiatry, psychiatrist, excuse me, and uh, just ask for interpretations based upon their clinical knowledge, training, education, and experience. And these interpretations tend to revolve heavily around uh, personality and abnormal psychology. Um, and mostly, assessments for law enforcement are provided after the fact, once the suspect's already been apprehended, uh, or at least there is sufficient evidence for them to make some predictions they've had interaction with him or her before. Uh, if not, those are the cases that usually wind up at the FBI. Uh, but, you know, you've seen it time and time again where we have the shootings such as the recent Oregon University, the University in Oregon, I don't recall the name of the school, I'm sorry, where the individual um, shot up the school and after the fact everybody's got all sorts of opinions about his mental state. Well, it would have been grand to have that beforehand and there's a lot of reasons why we didn't have that beforehand and we'll talk about those as this program goes on further and uh, you, you're exposed to more and more uh, material because lack of access to the target is an inhibiting factor. 
it causes problems when you can't talk to or be exposed to that individual or people who know them. That's why intelligence profiling is so hard. Okay, so this is the profiling picture that everybody thinks of when they think of profilers, so we just put this in there as a bit of a joke. But uh, So criminal profiling uh, investigates an offender's behavior, motives, and backgrounds in an attempt to apprehend the suspect or the subject. Okay. Investigative profiling involves crime scene assessment, predictive profiling, investigative suggestions. Okay. We would recommend that the detectives look at such and such and so and so. Interview and media strategy. If we're going to talk to the press and we want to influence this bad guy, then maybe our public relations person wants to say X, Y, and Z. And veracity assessment. How true is the information we've given, the evidence that we've seen, the reports that the detectives have written, how true are they within the context of this individual's personality? Uh, just a little bit about the FBI Behavioral Sciences Unit. I think their, their name was changed uh, fairly recently. Uh, but between 1979 and 83, the BSU agents entered into prisons and they interviewed uh, convicted bad guys about their backgrounds, crimes, crime scenes, and their victims. And they researched official sources of information like transcripts and uh, medical and criminal records, police reports, and they collected data. And that data or data, depending upon what part of the country you're from, was uh, correlated and institutionalized as a profiling method. Uh, Canada has also been very active in uh, being involved in institutionalizing profiling. Uh, and that laid the groundwork for those state and local, you remember this term, force multipliers, because they began to train state and local law enforcement uh, personnel to become profilers in the field um, in a different way than what we're doing with you, but nonetheless some similarities there. Okay, so let's look at a few common definitions. and. You really need to begin to read up on this material, uh, these, these types of, of definitions and these terms. Uh, we'll provide you a reading list. We really should have already had that up for you, but we'll get that up for you very soon. The signature behavior is the behavior at or actions that fulfill a psychological or physical need in the target. Okay, um, We'll get into that in depth, but, but basically it's, it's one reason that individual needs to commit that crime. Okay. Typolo typology is the model of a personality type based on the psychological functions. Okay? What, what type of personality is this? What can we expect from this type of personality? Again, we'll cover all these in detail later in the program. We just want you to be able to pause this video, do a little internet research of your own, and, and look at some text and see what these words mean. Character is the system of a relatively permanent motivational other traits that are manifested in the characteristic ways that a target relates to others and reacts to various kinds of challenges. What's the character of this target? What is he or she likely to do based upon their typology? And based upon that typology, what might we expect by way of signature behaviors? What should we be looking for? Will they typically leave um, uh, a particular item behind it is seen, a particular piece of evidence. Will they uh, leave a particular mark behind uh, that's really too in-depth to get into in this session, but please do read up on these. You'll need this information later. And just a few more definitions. Temperament is the, uh, the stable individual differences in quality and intensity of emotional reaction present at birth. So this is your uh, proclivity your tendency to act in a certain way okay through your own emotions and the modus operandi what's that typically called on TV the MO right what the target has to do to accomplish his or her crime to ensure the success of the crime to protect his or her own identity and to effect escape okay so what is that the MO of that target all right so here's a few differences uh, and similarities between behavioral profiling and HDA profiling. And we will concentrate on HDA profiling throughout this course because it encompasses behavioral profiling, it includes behavioral profiling as well. All right, 
So you'll see those first three yellow bullets, they are identical, right? And then behavioral profiling, when you get down to the white bullets, assesses typology, assesses character, assesses temperament. Well, HDI profiling does all of that, but it also applies clinical behavioral assessments. That is, we look at those behavioral assessments and try to determine how that bad guy will actually operate based on that assessment, okay? We will assess victimology. What kind of victims do a particular types, do particular types of bad guys desire, seek out, and execute their crime upon? We assess evidence from scenes, just like uh, standard crime scene profiling, behavioral profiling does. Uh, we do that as well in HDA profiling. But we also compute, compile and fuse all case data. And we, we're not insinuating that typical law enforcement profilers leave something out. But in the case of specifically of intelligence profiling, we have data that the average street profiler, the street cop profiler, might not have access to. Now certainly the FBI at its higher levels has access to that data. And then we try to help determine the best process to capture uh, that target or perhaps engage in, shall we say, more vigorous pursuits of that target. So what sort of competencies, skill sets, abilities should we be able to expect from an operational behavior profiler? Okay, Personal integrity. Right. If your word can't be trusted in the field, then your profiles won't be trusted in the field. You need to begin thinking about that now if you want a career in this profession, okay? That's exactly uh, what your background investigators are going to be looking for when you enter into this or try to enter into this profession. Do you have the integrity necessary to represent law enforcement or intelligence uh, to the general public and to your peers, to your supervisors, and to the courts? You need familiarity with the techniques of behavioral and social sciences as related to human targeting, okay? So if you are in school, every course you take in the behavioral and social sciences, even including anthropology and archaeology, not that archaeology is a social science, but uh, you should be looking at those sorts of courses and saying, how can I apply this to being a profiler, to targeting human beings for capture? Um, or to prevent, uh, to mitigate surprise or to prevent harm to the public. You need to have a knowledge of analytical and investigative profile processes. You'll get some of that in this course. If you go all the way through to the advanced profiler program, you'll get a lot of this material. Uh, in the course of, in the, in the process of these three courses, if you pursue all three, uh, technician, basic, and advanced, you'll have more profiling training than the average police officer ever gets in his or her career. You'll need to work on your interpersonal and verbal communication skills. Uh, that's one reason that I don't edit, we don't edit these training classes. We want you to see that we, um, that we're thoughtful in our approach to our speech. Uh, we certainly make mistakes just like every other human being does, but we, strive to put the point across to you that we have experience uh, and that we have some background in what we're doing and that you can trust us. Well, you need to put that same persona forward when you're dealing with law enforcement. Uh, to that end, uh, another thing that, that we would stress to you is that you should begin to learn uh, good writing techniques, reading comprehension, and you should learn to use PowerPoint as well because the majority of intelligence and law enforcement briefings are conducted just like these briefings I'm doing with you tonight, today, uh, through PowerPoint because it's an easy way, a concise way to get the point across. Um, case management, we'll talk to you about those skills as you go through this process and critical thinking skills. You need to learn to thoroughly weigh all of the evidence to question yourself, to question your peers, to not get your feelings hurt when somebody disagrees with you. Uh, I have before presented very well thought out, deliberate, intense, and well evidenced cases to uh, sheriffs and had them uh, and other executives and have them just laugh at me because they didn't believe 
any of it, any of this science. Um, they're elected officials, many of them hadn't been in law enforcement before, and to walk in and show them this science was just more than they could comprehend, and they just blew it off. Well, you've got to be able to let that roll off your back, uh, roll off your shoulders, and move on to the next thing. So operational behavior profiles uh, are new and unique products that are derived from observed and or reported human and social dimensions. So we look into all the various dimensions of the person and the culture they live in, the environment they live in. We do in-depth analysis of their functional coda. That's, we'll talk about that uh, much more in future, in future classes. But functional coda is a BFI uh, copyright term that describes how people think and react and characterize what's important to them in their daily life in the context of their operational personality. You know, Osama bin Laden was a completely different personality uh, in one setting than the next, and, and most people are. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through some, some case studies where you can see that uh, there are people who are the same all the time. They're just bad guys 24-7, you know. They'll kill you, but they'll kill their family too. Um, and we'll, we'll go through all of those sorts of examples, and we don't have time to do that in this session. The operational personality is the totality of a person's tactical and strategic behavioral characteristics within the context of his culture, ideology, values, and motivations. So it's the total person within the context of where and how he exists and where and what he wants to get done. Operational behavior personalities and intelligence are assessed knowing that the target is probably thinking that he is being pursued and observed. Okay? So the bad guy knows you're after him is what that sentence means. OPBs are revolutionary. They're about, uh, that process is now about 20 years old, 15 years old, and they're revolutionary in that they are investigative in nature and are based on the assertion that the best indicator of future operational behavior, operational, you, you just have to let that term sink into you, how the bad guy acts is the analysis of his past and observed operational behavior. So what he did in the past, he's likely to do in the future. So operational behavior profiles are designed to help the operators, the boots on the ground, the patrol officers, the detectives, force the needle from the haystack. We want to force that target, that bad guy, to move and force him or her to communicate so that we can pick up on them, figure out where they're going, what they're going to do next, we want to be able to detect abnormal behavior and identify and exploit their vulnerabilities. We want to identify what that target wants or what he thinks he wants and be able to exploit that so that we can capture. We want to conduct our profiles in such a way that we can fully assess what resources the targets have to achieve their goals. How many friends have they got? How much money have they got? How many cars have they got? Where are they likely to go? We want to be able to exploit their character, you know, take advantage of their character weaknesses. We want to be able to exploit their emotions. We want to identify the indicators that influence them, uh, be able to determine how we can influence them, how others influence them. And we want to empower our profiling team to make inferences. If X happens, then it's probably because the target thinks or wants to do why. All right. So here's a couple of examples of OBB, OBP analytical questions. In regard to force protection, let's say that uh, you're an intelligence profiler and you've been asked to consider that a team is going to move on a bad guy and attempt to make an arrest, uh, bring him in for questioning, whatever the case may be. What specific unusual force protection should cautions, you, sh, cautions should the troops use to, uh, excuse me, should troops exercise in regard to this target? Uh, this individual is likely to set off a suicide vest, or he's likely to use his children as a human shield. Okay, that's an example. Will this target respond to verbal commands in what language? You know, a pointed gun speaks the universal language but it helps to have an interpreter there that can communicate exactly what you want to communicate. You know, if you want to take away all the computers, hard drives, uh, external hard drives, uh, files and so forth that are in a house, you need to be able to tell the occupants of that house 
we need all that, that information. So that team needs to know through your profile what language that individual speaks and uh, how to communicate. How will this target react if cornered? How will this target react to potential capture if in a group situation? Is he likely to be more masculine in a group situation or is he more likely to be concerned about the peers or the family member he or she is with? So uh, some uh, insights into motivation. Does the target feel, indicate, or act out against an accumulation of grievances caused by economic, ethnic, racial, or religious difficulties or by revenge? You know, is this a person whose sole motivation is that uh, he lives in the jungles of Colombia and he feels that for his entire life he has been shorted by the Colombian government. Is this individual, does he live in the inner city and he's historically felt that he deserved better in life and he's uh, recently been rejected by his girlfriend and that's liable to cause him to act out in X, Y, or Z way. Does the target indicate he's previously received blows to his ego? You know, if you look at some of these active shooters, these school shooters, you'll see that tendency a lot. Is it feasible that frustration has contributed to or formed the foundation of the target's aggression? We gave a few examples of that in the first two bullets. Uh, what's his behavior as a group member? You know, what does the group look for in its victims? Are they primarily interested in hard targets? Hard targets are uh, targets that uh, are well defended, okay? Do they want to attack hard targets to show that they can, or are they driven by soft targets? Are they likely to change focus? Why or why not? Uh, have there been significant deviations from the group's original purpose? Were they original criminals and that originally criminals and now they're terrorists? Were they originally terrorists and now they're just, you know, driven by money and material materialism and power? Uh, terrorists experience the most important lear learning activities in the uh, context of the group. What have those experiences been for this group? So then we have the emerging issues. You know, you as analysts should be trained to ask the right questions. That's what we want to help you do here as, as profilers. You need professional development. You need to be involved in training and education. You need to uh, understand how analysis is conducted. You need to understand where to get the education you need. You need to know how to do research and the common standards of this profession. None of this is going to be, uh, not much of this is going to be learned in a few weeks. It takes years. But you joined BFI and those of you that joined the National Profiles Association, joined NPA, because you wanted a starting place. That's the whole purpose of this program. This is your starting place. So we're going to talk to you about all this. And we'll also have some, um, some Skype type sessions, some video teleconferences where we'll get together and work with you very specifically on, on some of these things. There's a need for databases. That's beyond us right now, but there is a need for improved technology. Uh, we need intelligence-specific profiling techniques. That's what OPBs are. Um, excuse me, OBPs are. You know, those are getting better and better. And we need profilers that are willing to step out, do the right thing, take a risk, and, and make those predictions that are necessary to public and national safety and security. Well, that concludes this first session of your training at the Behavioral Forensics Institute. It was quite a bit of information, wasn't it? We understand that, but we also wanted to expose you to enough information that you could get a good feel as to what's coming. Uh, you could watch this tape, uh, this, this video, if you will, over and over. Uh, we wanted you to have faith in us. We wanted you to see a member of the faculty so that you'd know we're real live human beings and we wanted you to know that we care very deeply about you, your success, and your career. So uh, watch this video as many times as, as it takes for some of this to sink into you. Uh, we're sorry it's so fast-paced, but that's just the way it has to be for a course like this. And we will ad address your questions. In fact, we will have on the, um, your training page with this video, if you'll uh, glance over to the side, you'll see a form where you can submit questions. Uh, you may not get those back the same day or even the next day, but the faculty will get them for you when you can, when we can and get them back to you. Uh, so we'll leave this video up for a little while for you. 
and uh, your next session will concern professional career development and being hired as a profiler, uh, managing and maintaining your career as a profiler. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this first session. And I'm Dr. Russell Baker, the director of the profiling program, and I look forward to being with you again very soon. Thank you for your time.